It may have been the greatest army of all time, conquering and controlling an empire that stretched across the ancient Western world. It was ruthless, disciplined, and feared by all, not just by its enemies, who died in their millions, but by its own emperors, who often paid the price of the army's wrath. And yet, these soldiers were builders as well as destroyers, helping to spread a culture that became the bedrock of Western civilization. What was it that made this army so dominant? How was it able to rule and reshape the classical world? And why did it eventually fall? This is the story of the Roman War Machine. The glory that was Rome was built largely upon the power of its army. Until it discovered how to wage war, Rome was just another small Italian farming settlement. But there was something different about the Romans. They had a unique ability to turn themselves into a political and military power without equal. The city that would dominate the ancient world for centuries began as early as 1000 BC. Archaeologists have found the remains of dwellings from that period on Rome's Palatine Hill, where many centuries later, the Roman emperors built their palaces. Early Rome was dominated by a neighbor, the Etruscans, from what is now Tuscany to the north. Etruscan kings took control of Rome around 600 BC and ruled it for a century before the Romans expelled them. Rome then began creating the political and military system we recognize today. Rome became a republic with the Senate and two chief executives, the consuls, who were elected for one-year terms to handle important matters, including the military. Rome had to learn how to fight because it occupied an important trading crossroads on the Tiber River and it was always skirmishing with envious neighbors. As early as 500 BC, Rome had an army of 6,000 men called a legion, from the Latin word meaning conscription. But this was a far cry from the professional Roman army that would later dominate the world. They are citizen soldiers, they are part-time soldiers. They get recruited for the campaigning season they leave their fields, their work, to go off and fight in the army. At the end of the campaign, they're back, bringing in the harvest, bringing in the vintage, plowing the fields. Every year, able-bodied Roman men were summoned by trumpet to report for enlistment. But not all men. Only landowners were trusted to fight for Rome because they had something to protect. Service was regarded as a duty and an honor and a must for any Roman seeking political power. The Roman people are reluctant to vote for people who cannot show their war wounds. There are many stories of people standing for politics in the forum, ripping their clothes to show their wounds, to demonstrate that they have fought for Rome in battle. Romans had to provide their own armor and weapons. So the wealthiest, the officers, had a helmet, armor, a spear, a sword, and a shield, while the poorest, the front ranks, had no armor and had only slings and stones for weapons. The early Roman army was modeled on the Greeks, especially the basic tactical formation. The Greek army used the so-called phalanx, a tight-knit, rolling infantry formation which came at the enemy like a forest of spears. Your whole army lined up facing forward in lines. And then the first few ranks would hold out their spears and their shields, and the army would move forward en masse. Uh, the object was to simply push aside the enemy and in, in the course of it, kill as many as possible. 
Rome's first major victory was against its old nemesis, the Etruscans, when Rome conquered the nearby city of Veii in 396 BC. But the Romans didn't have long to celebrate. Six years later, they met an entirely new kind of enemy, when Celtic warriors from the north swept down upon Rome. The Celts were a people linked by language, culture, and style of warfare. And Celtic tribes were spread across Europe, from Ireland to France and Switzerland. In 390 BC, a Celtic army thrashed the Roman legion and overran Rome. The Celtic method of fighting was very disturbing to them. The Celts uh, simply ran at you with hundreds and thousands of men, yelling, shouting, uh, banging on metal objects, blowing their horns. They really terrified the Romans. The Celts left the city only after the Romans bribed them with gold. This was Rome's wake-up call. It needed to rethink its whole military strategy if it was to survive, and one way was through training. Roman soldiers had to go through the toughest training in the ancient world. There were four long, hard months of basic training, and anyone who couldn't stand the pace was either discharged or put on rations of foul-tasting barley until they got it right. Basic training began with marching and plenty of it. Soldiers had to be able to march more than 20 miles in five hours, carrying a full pack. In weapons training, recruits were given dummy swords, shields, and javelins that weighed twice as much as the real things to build muscles. The Romans, I think, uh, in, in this early period, should really be seen as the, the Zulus of the Mediterranean world. They uh, are a highly militarized society. And like the Zulus, they don't let their warriors have sex. So when they come into battle, they're very tough. As the army grew, armor became standardized for all soldiers and provided by the state. I'm wearing a male shirt for body protection. And you can see it's made of small individual pieces of metal, which are fashioned into rings and then linked together. Its biggest advantage, of course, is to take slashing blows across. Because the male links all sit together, if an enemy hit me with a sword in a slashing way, it would actually take the blow. The disadvantage of male was that it doesn't, in fact, take a, a stabbing at all. If you stab through the male, the point of the sword will actually pierce the rings. Beginning in the first century AD, the Romans also used segmented plate armor, held together by leather straps. It was so much more complicated than male armor that soldiers needed help to put it on. I think you see all the protections on the top rather than around the legs and things. And the reason for that is that when you've got the, the Celts fighting you, with their long slashing swords needed all that protection up on the top rather than the bottom. They also give you a chance to run. The Roman helmet gradually redesigned over the centuries, aimed to give maximum protection without blocking the sensors. You can see it's a round bowl protecting the top of my head. Round because it's got very good glancing blow action. A square helmet would take the blow, whereas a round helmet, the blow would glance off. Large cheek pieces to protect the side of my face, and a small neck guard at the back to actually take an overhand blow protecting the back of my neck. Now, obviously, you can see there's no covering on my face or on my ears, in fact. And the Romans decided that it was a lot better for a soldier to be able to see around him and hear orders, very vital in battle. Further protection came from the Roman shield, smaller and round in early times, developing later into a bigger rectangular one. It was made of layers of wood glued together, bound, and covered with leather and metal. The thing about the Roman shield is it's curved, not flat like most shields of the time. This gives me protection all around my body. And if I'm coming at you in battle, it's not only a defensive weapon, it's an offensive weapon. I can smash you in the face, and then while you're off balance, draw the sword and in under your ribs. When it came to offensive weapons, the first one the Roman soldier would use in battle was the javelin. 
great thing about the Roman javelin is, when you threw it, the enemy couldn't throw it back. These are delivered in volleys of hundreds. As they rain down, the hard iron tip will punch through the armor. The weight of the handle will bend this soft metal shank. It'll be useless, you can't throw it back. Your shield is useless, you're probably hurt, you're in big trouble. But the weapon that won the empire and kept it was the Roman sword. Once the javelins had been expended, the Roman legion would then move in with probably the most vicious of his weapons, the short sword, or gladius in Latin, very much a close quarter weapon. It's much shorter than you would envisage a sort of a medieval broadsword to be, because it actually is much shorter. It's designed with a very broad base, tapering to a very, very sharp point. Now, the idea of this weapon was purely to stab. The soldier was trained to actually stab into an enemy soldier, mainly in the stomach area, because, of course, there's no bone for it to actually get jammed in. And, of course, a quick stab and withdrawal will put him out of action one way or the other. Now, the soldier was trained not to use an overhand blow, but purely a stabbing action. In the modern way, a soldier uses the bayonet, really. The thing about this Roman sword is it's short and to the point, and it's used for stabbing rather than slashing. Uh, the barbarians, their swords aren't like ours. They're long and broad. And it's all an ego trip on the battlefield, slashing around above their heads, all style. That's all it is. And while they're doing that, it's up and under stabbing to the ribs, and we so we make mincemeat to the barbarians. The Roman army was ready to use their weapons and training to build an empire, and the first victims were their fellow Italians. The basic unit of the Roman army was the legion, and over time, it became highly structured. Eventually, the legion evolved into a unit of 4,800 soldiers. It was divided into 10 cohorts of 480 men each, which in turn contained six centuries. Not 100 men, as you might expect, but 80 soldiers. Each century had 10 groups of eight men who shared a tent. The legionary commanders were usually political appointments, Roman noblemen doing service as they climbed the political ladder. Their military ability varied greatly, and so much of the real running of the army fell to the officers beneath them. The most famous of these was the centurion, in charge of a century of soldiers. As Rome's empire grew, centurions became career soldiers, working their way up through the ranks. Centurions usually had at least 15 years' experience. It was their job to train the men, discipline them, and lead them in battle. Because they'd seen so many campaigns, they understood the traditions of the army. They knew how the army could actually solve particular problems which it might encounter in future campaigns. So they were very much the, the living essence of the Roman legions. Well, I'm in the equipment of a Roman centurion. You can always immediately tell the centurion because his crest goes across his helmet. In this case, the crest is made of horse hair, though sometimes they were made of feathers. And if he'd been given military awards, you can see they're worn on a harness on the chest. Centurions were career officers who took the term literally. The centurions never had to retire. We find some cases of people over 80 still serving. So this, of course, helps to secure uniformity of, of standards and, and, and training and so on throughout, throughout the empire. You see careers of these centurions who've been all over the place in their very long lifetime. Centurions could make a soldier's life hell. They demanded bribes to excuse soldiers from the less popular duties and used their vine staffs to deliver punishment. One centurion, Lucilius, was nicknamed Give Me Another for his practice of breaking his staff over soldiers' backs. He was later murdered by his own men. After its early defeat by Celtic warriors in 390 BC, the Roman army changed its battle tactics. It did away with the rigid phalanx formation it had borrowed from the Greeks and used smaller fighting units called maniples or handfuls, highly maneuverable groups of less than 150 men. This allowed the, the Roman army to uh, operate more effectively, perhaps on, on rather rougher ground, but also it allowed them to move groups of soldiers around to the flanks and to the rear of, uh, of enemy armies. 
While the basis of the Roman army was its infantry, the foot soldier, each legion also had an attachment of up to 300 cavalry. The Romans were not natural horsemen, so they adapted tactics and gear from their enemies, including the Celts. One example was the military saddle. The saddle on top of it is a very odd looking beast to most people now. It doesn't look like a modern saddle at all. The most obvious feature are the four horns on it. And the four horns are there because of the thing that is obviously missing. There are no stirrups at all. The Romans didn't ride with stirrups. The saddle that developed after they'd fought with the Celts had this, these horns as a very significant feature. If you've got no stirrups, as I said, you can't lean out sideways very safely on a flat saddle. These horns enable you to do that. The saddle looks short compared to a modern saddle because the back horns press against your backside, the front horns go under your thigh, and you can lean out probably to about 45 degrees with relative safety. Part of the cavalry's job was to harass the enemy, and the riders carried special light javelins for that purpose. As you pass an enemy, you can lob several of them at them. They're not going to do a huge amount of damage, but your purpose isn't necessarily to do a lot of damage. It's to make the formation break up so that the infantry can get in and win. In battle, the cavalry lined up on the wings of the legions. The infantry formed three horizontal lines so they could take turns at being the front line until the battle was won. As the Romans formed up to start the battle, they banged their swords against their shields in a frightening drum roll until the order came to charge. As the two sides closed in on each other, the Roman front lines would launch their javelins, disrupting the enemy formation. The infantry would form wedges to break up the enemy lines and allow close-in fighting. That was when the short Roman stabbing sword would come into its own. The fighting itself might be only 20 minutes or so. Um, sometimes it was a lot longer, but it was very difficult to fight for a great length of time with this massive weight of armor that Roman soldiers and often their enemies wore. Part of the reason for Roman success in, in battle was undoubtedly to do with training. Once an enemy cracked, the Romans did not surround them. Instead, they usually left an easy escape route so that the cavalry could come in and cut them down as they fled. By 270 BC, Rome controlled much of the Italian peninsula. But unlike many ancient powers, it did not simply pillage its defeated neighbors, it turned them into allies, sometimes offering them Roman citizenship. That way, as Rome expands, the people whom it conquers are integrated, form part of the Roman army, and become the troops for the next wave of conquest out. So it's a cumulative process. And that, I think, is key to the success and the growth of this empire. Rome's expansion made a clash inevitable with Carthage, another Mediterranean superpower. And when that clash came, it would produce the most horrendous war the ancient world had ever seen. Rome's expansion in the 200s BC brought it into conflict with another empire across the Mediterranean. The city of Carthage in modern-day Tunisia commanded an empire stretching across northern Africa. In 264 BC, Rome and Carthage began fighting over control of Sicily, where Carthage had colonies. Rome found itself at a disadvantage. Carthage had a great navy, and Rome had almost none. Rome began building one, but most of its soldiers had never sailed, so they practiced on dry land, pretending to row in unison to get a feel for it. And when it came time for the real sea battles, Rome had a trick up its sleeve. It developed a kind of gangplank called a corvus that hooked onto Carthaginian ships so that the Roman soldiers could board them, turning naval battles into more familiar land battles. And that way, Rome routed the Carthaginian fleet. Rome won Sicily, Corsica, and Sardinia, but Carthage did not accept the defeat. In 218 BC, 
Carthage hit back under one of the most feared warriors Rome would ever face, Hannibal. And this time, the target was Rome itself. Hannibal was a man clearly with tremendous determination, a great personal hatred of Rome, which he'd inherited from his, his family, who'd fought the Romans before. And it's also very clear that he had great personal magnetism. Hannibal marched his army through Spain and France and across the Alps into Italy, accompanied by three dozen elephants. Most of Hannibal's elephants died on the journey over the Alps. And in fact, uh, his elephants played absolutely no role in the subsequent campaign. Uh, nevertheless, they uh, represent uh, the skill and boldness that uh, Hannibal uh, portrayed in uh, coming over the Alps so early in the campaigning season and surprising the Romans. With the help of Celtic warriors who joined him on the way, Hannibal won early victories against Roman legions sent to meet him. Then, in 216 BC, came a major showdown at Cannae in southern Italy. Hannibal had about 40,000 troops, while the Romans and their allies had nearly twice that number. But Hannibal was a master tactician. When the Roman legions made their usual thrust towards his center, Hannibal let them advance, then encircled them. It was a disaster for the Roman army. Some 50,000 Romans and allies were killed. There was panic in Rome, with cries of Hannibal is at the gates. But Hannibal was never able to capture Rome, because Rome's ingenious policy of creating allies paid off once again. What defeats Hannibal is the fact that the Romans have got eight, nine, ten times as many men able to be impressed into the army as Hannibal has got. And they can lose 50,000 men in a day. And they keep on fighting, because they've got the, the manpower. And no other state in the ancient world could ever achieve anything like that. Rome practiced total war against Hannibal. As an emergency measure, it called up every available man, even slaves, and sent legions to Carthage-held Spain to stop supplies and reinforcements from reaching Hannibal. The wars on, on this scale are fights for survival, literally for survival. If you lose these kind of wars in the early period, your city is destroyed, your women and children are dispersed across the Mediterranean world. That's the end of it. All societies are destroyed if battles are lost. It took 15 years of fighting before Hannibal was forced out of Italy. He returned to Carthage to defend it against a counterattack by the Romans, who finally defeated Hannibal in 202 BC. But despite the victory, Rome maintained a paranoid fear of Carthage and provoked a third war in 149 BC. It took the Roman legions three years to breach Carthage's huge city walls, and then the Romans slaughtered unknown thousands of Carthaginians and sold 50,000 survivors into slavery. Finally, the Romans leveled the city, plowed it into the ground, and according to legend, sowed it with salt so that nothing would ever grow there again. Any Roman army was capable of extreme brutality, particularly in the sack of a city which had resisted them and which they then managed to break into. Under those circumstances, it seems to have been normal Roman practice, almost policy, to slaughter absolutely everybody and everything, including animals. Everybody was just chopped to pieces. It was absolute carnage. After defeating Carthage, Rome also added Greece as a province after destroying the city of Corinth. Many other conquests followed, so that by 100 BC, Rome was undisputed master of the Mediterranean. The Romans justified their expansion in a way that many modern-day politicians would understand. They always convinced themselves that they fight defensive wars. No Roman war, no matter how offensive or imperialist it might look to us, to the Romans, it was always a matter of defense, always fending off an attack. So in a sense, that's how they justified a Mediterranean conquest. 
As rulers of a rapidly expanding empire, the legions had to get used to a lot of travel, and that meant travel on foot. When Roman soldiers marched, they carried up to 50 pounds of equipment on their backs, including weapons, armor, cooking utensils, rations, and tools for building a temporary camp. Most armies relied on natural defenses. The Romans carried the tools to build a new camp wherever they were, a new one each day if necessary. They dug a defensive ditch around the whole camp, five feet wide and three feet deep, then built a palisade with the stakes they carried with them. It was as though the Romans had their own fortified city wherever they went. The primary purpose of a Roman marching camp is psychological rather than military. It's the idea that in enemy territory, every night you make a small city in what is not your territory. And the enemy look on, seeing their territory pockmarked by the advance of Roman armies. The camps were a classic example of the Romans' passion for order. Every camp had an identical plan. Each leather tent was put up in the same position each time, so that the soldiers knew exactly where they were. The soldiers had a great sense of security during the night. They knew exactly where their officers were and the fact that their comrades were, were guarding them as well. The Roman obsession with order extended to the discipline of the troops. Camp sentries who fell asleep could be stoned to death for having endangered the whole regiment. It wasn't as exceptional as it might sound, given the general background of what Roman society was like. People were used to flogging. They were used to fairly frequent public executions. So the Roman army was indeed pretty draconian, but not as different from the rest of society as perhaps we might think. One infamous form of harsh discipline was decimation, the killing of one man in 10 of regiments that showed cowardice in battle. The men were selected by lot and clubbed to death by their comrades. Roman obedience was based on fear. If a Roman soldier was faced by a crisis in battle, that Roman soldier, that unit of soldiers, would stand their ground because they were more likely to survive a desperate fight in battle than to survive if they ran away. One famous case of decimation came when Roman legions suffered several defeats during a revolt led by an escaped gladiator, a warrior called Spartacus. The Roman army was so busy conquering and building an empire on foreign soil that it had no standing army back home in Italy, and that left it open to surprise attack. That's just what happened in 73 BC in a revolt led by a foreign slave named Spartacus, who had been forced to become a gladiator. Conditions for all slaves uh, were uh, relatively cruel and brutal, and uh, particularly for gladiators who were kept uh, chained in barracks and uh, were brutally treated. Spartacus led a revolt by fellow gladiators against their conditions and was soon joined in the uprising by slaves from the countryside. Millions of slaves were brought back into Italy, and a lot of them were prisoners of war, a lot of them were ex-warriors. And therefore, although uh, many of them were kept in barracks and many of them were trained to be gladiators, they were a potential security risk. Because there were no legions stationed in Italy at the time, new legions had to be quickly raised and trained. But Spartacus and his men, using guerrilla tactics, defeated each legion sent to meet him, and his band remained at large in Italy for three years. The Roman Senate finally gave the nobleman Marcus Crassus the power to quell the revolt. To show he was serious, he began by decimating two of the legions that had lost to Spartacus, then raised six new legions and met the Spartacans in open warfare their tactics were so unconventional. They refused to give battle until the very end 
in a conventional way. They confounded the expectations of the generals and the armies sent against them. In a sense, their mistake and what lost them their final battle was to behave like Roman soldiers, to fight a conventional pitched battle. Had they stuck to guerrilla warfare, their revolt might have been even more effective than it was. The legions defeated the rebel army and killed Spartacus. And then Crassus lined the Appian Way outside Rome with 6,000 crucified Spartacans, a lesson to anyone who opposed Rome and her army. In the early days of the Roman army, soldiers were called away for only a few months at a time between spring and harvest. But the expanding empire meant long campaigns overseas. And for property owners, the only men eligible for the legions, military service became an ever-increasing hardship. By 100 BC, Rome had about 130,000 men in uniform. One Roman man in eight was a soldier, and he was required to do up to six years of service in one stretch, and a maximum of 16 years over his lifetime. The legions needed a bigger pool of manpower to draw on. And the man who made it possible was the consul Marius, himself a great general. Twice he had saved Rome from invasion with victories over German tribes. In the fields near Aix-en-Provence in southern France in 102 BC, Marius's army killed so many Germans, 100,000 by one account, that farmers had bumper crops for years afterwards because of the blood and bones in the soil. As consul, Marius decided to throw the ranks open to all Roman citizens, whether they owned land or not. This meant poor Romans could volunteer for a secure and prestigious job with good pay and travel. They could become career soldiers. The Roman army was now on its way to becoming a full-time professional force. But volunteers still had to meet strict requirements. They had to be tall, preferably literate, and have good character references. Certain professions were preferred, including blacksmiths and hunters. Those considered not suitable included weavers and tavern keepers. New recruits had to pass an interview and a medical exam, and then had to take an oath to perform whatever they were commanded for the Roman state, and to not shrink from death. They were then given three gold pieces and sent to the provinces for training. But many of these new, poorer soldiers were already looking beyond three gold pieces. As the army kept adding new conquests, soldiers were increasingly focused on the spoils of war. The amount of booty they were able to bring back from cities like Corinth in 146 BC was so enormous that I think it did encourage massive greed and uh, an, uh, an increasing level of brutality among Roman soldiers. Increasingly, soldiers turned their loyalty from the Roman state to their own generals who could make them rich. And the generals, being Roman aristocrats, saw their legions as tickets to wealth and power. Intimately related as the general and his army the general promises his army land, booty, settlement after the war has finished. And the army promises the general not only success in conquest, but votes back in Rome afterwards. This led to a new class of super generals, all with political ambitions. There was Marius himself, a consul for many years. His rival Sulla, who won victories in the Eastern Mediterranean and became dictator of Rome for a time. Pompey the Great, who conquered Syria and Palestine. And the most famous general of all, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar represents as close as I think you can get to naked ambition in the first century BC. There's a famous story of Julius Caesar aged 31 in further Spain, coming across a statue of that great conqueror, Alexander the Great, and suddenly bursting into tears. And his entourage say, why, Caesar, are you crying? And he says, this man, 
by my age, had conquered most of the world, and I have done nothing. Within a few years, the world would know that Caesar had done a great deal. Of all Rome's great generals, none created more fame, bloodshed, loyalty, and hatred than Julius Caesar. He was a nobleman who worked his way up the political ladder and used his military command in Spain to pillage enough booty to buy votes in Rome. He was made a consul and formed a political alliance, the Triumvirate, with the rival general Pompey and Marcus Crassus, the richest man in Rome. Caesar then had himself made governor of northern Italy and southern France, which made him commander of several legions. He was anxious for more conquests, and his chance soon came. In 58 BC, a Celtic people, the Helvetii, asked Caesar's permission to migrate from Switzerland to western France, across Roman allies' territory in what was then called Gaul. Instead of agreeing, Caesar decided to attack. Caesar, of course, is a cynic. He needs a war. He needs the booty derived from that to finance his political campaigns. Before he goes on campaign in Gaul, he is deeply in debt. Gaul will provide the booty for repaying his creditors. Caesar sent six legions against the Helvetii's 360,000 men, women, and children. More than half the Helvetii were slaughtered, and the survivors forced to return to their homeland. was a part of the political struggle at Rome in the late Republic. Pompey, his great rival, was Rome's best general. So Caesar, competing against Pompey, he has to be a better general. After dispatching the Helvetii, Caesar set after a German tribe that had crossed the Rhine and marched his troops 120 miles in five days to the Alsace region. Again, the Romans slaughtered thousands. Caesar then turned west towards Belgium and repeated the dose against the tribe there. Caesar's political foes in Rome decried his actions, but most Romans cheered him on because he was defeating Gauls, the very same Celtic people who'd sacked Rome in 390 BC. The Romans' fear of Celtic peoples, like the Gauls, was more than historical. It was also physical. Partly the sheer size of the Celts. The Italians were a fairly small people, and compared to them, the Gauls, for example, were absolutely enormous, you know, sort of six-footers um, that the Italians weren't used to. For example, we're told that Julius Caesar was tall for a Roman. He was only five foot six. To the Romans, anyone who didn't speak Latin or Greek, such as the Celts, was looked down upon as a barbarian because the language sounded like sheep, ba ba. The Romans have a very particular view of themselves, and that is to see themselves as people who've developed the powers of the mind to control the body. Barbarians, on the other hand, are people who are led by physical desire, sex and drugs and rock and roll. They don't have a proper education, so they go for the, the nearest thrill. But the Celts that Caesar was fighting in Gaul were far from barbarians as we know the term. They lived in organized towns, like this reconstruction in France, and they were master ironworkers who probably invented the chain mail armor that the Romans adopted. And the Celts' artwork was anything but barbaric. It's still regarded as one of the great artistic traditions of Europe. As warriors, the so-called barbarians were no match for Caesar's well-trained legions. Celtic warriors did not fight as a unit, they fought for individual glory. The big men like to show up dressed in uh, fancy, shiny armor, uh, stand at the front, uh, and engage in warfare that was no doubt fairly brutal, but was fairly small scale. They couldn't plan total war in the way that the Romans could plan. They didn't have uh, fully trained legions. They didn't have logistic backup. 
Also, the Celts were up against a brilliant commander in Julius Caesar. He was ambitious, hungry for victories, and used daring and original tactics. He was noted for the speed and surprise of his movements. And he really brought uh, those techniques to uh, perfection in using his legions. Uh, on the other hand, he was a little reckless, uh, part of his daring. Uh, and he often got himself into terrible scrapes. But uh, he was so quick and uh, so perceptive of the enemy's intentions that he was always able to get himself out. From the word go, he was prepared to adapt. I mean, coming up against the Germans for the first time in, in his first campaign, enormous numbers of cavalry. He had virtually none. No problem. He simply gets in horses and tells one legion, right, boys, you're, you're all going to be cavalry. Suddenly he has 5,000 cavalry. Caesar knew he asked a lot of his soldiers, and so he went out of his way to cultivate an intense loyalty from them. He didn't ask them to do anything that he didn't do, and he often dismissed his uh, bodyguard and had his horse led away and actually uh, stood in the ranks with the troops. And uh, his troops were very loyal to him. Not surprisingly, these loyal soldiers were also becoming wealthy soldiers through booty and slaves. The spoils of war were often won through great brutality. Caesar himself boasted that his campaigns in Gaul left a million dead and a million enslaved. Caesar just carried out what I've called uh, actually a big game hunt. He took his legions back and forth across Gaul, uh, slaughtering troops, uh, pillaging towns, killing women, children. Uh, the Romans were terribly cruel on the Celts. Defeated enemies were often made into slaves. Slavery was tremendously important to Rome. 40% of the Italian population were slaves the same percentage as the American South before the Civil War. Slaves are fundamental to Rome's war effort. Essentially, slaves free the Roman citizen to fight in the army. Without slavery, it would have been impossible for Rome so effectively to initiate these wars of conquest. Caesar's wars of conquest went on for nine years. He was the ultimate example of everything the Roman army had become in its first 500 years. Dedicated, ambitious, ruthless. And Caesar would not stop with foreign conquests. With his army behind him, he would conquer his enemies in Rome and take the title of dictator for life. 